I am so grateful and excited to have the amazing Anita Morjani in the podcast today. Thank you so much for your time and for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> and um, I, I remember um, I first heard about your story uh, from Wayne Dyer, <laughs> probably <laughs> like many, many, many people. Because I just, I love his audiobooks and I was on Maui and I was listening to one of his audiobooks and he was talking about you and um, how, he, how he heard about you the first time and then how he kind of made you to write the book and tell your story. And, um, and from yes. then I, I also was, wow, when he was telling your story, I was so amazed and it really touched me so deeply so I started to research you and um, it's so nice so today that we are sitting here and I can talk to you <laughs> so it's very very nice yeah oh that's yeah that's really wonderful and thank you I'm so happy you read Wayne's book and you know yes. who he is of so, course yeah yeah so um for all the people that haven't heard your story yet I know you told it I guess <laughs> so many times but would it be okay for you to just tell again like your story and your experience you had so that we can dive into this in, in the in the conversation yes sure I'll give a, a sort of a shortened version so yes. that we can dive into all the Perfect. other things um, so basically in 2006 I had end stage cancer it was stage 4 B lymphoma and what that means is that I had cancer of the lymph glands or the lymphatic system and it had spread throughout my body um, so I had tumors about the size of golf balls from the base of my skull um, all around my neck under my arms in my chest and all the way down to my abdomen and at that point um, I had my body had stopped absorbing nutrition and so my muscles completely deteriorated so I weighed about 85 pounds um, I was completely like a skeleton like skin and bones and uh, because my muscles had deteriorated I didn't even have the strength to stand up uh, I was always lying down or sitting down but my lungs were always filled with fluid And because of that, if I would lie flat, I would choke on my own fluid. And so on February the 2nd, 2006, my organs started to shut down one by one. My kidneys stopped functioning. And then I went into a coma. And the doctors told my family that I would not be coming back. I would not be coming out of the coma. And um, I had had cancer for four years so this had progressed over four years and um, while I was in the coma so I was in the hospital my family were around me my family were really distraught but while I was in the coma I left my body and I felt incredible my soul my spirit felt incredible and free and I felt more alive than I had ever felt in my life And I felt um, like I was surrounded by love, like I was just in this bathing in unconditional love. And I felt liberated and light. And, and I just wanted everyone to know that I was okay. And I was now finally free from my body and I was happy. Um, and Of course, there was no way for me to communicate this with my family because my physical body was lying there in the hospital bed, dying um, in a coma. And when I looked at my body, my body was so small and insignificant compared to how I was now feeling. I felt expanded like I was magnificent and powerful. And, uh, and then... I started to notice that I was surrounded by other spiritual beings. And one of them was my dad who had died 10 years prior. And another one was my best friend who had died two years prior. And so, uh, and then there were others who I didn't recognize. And um, the one thing I felt from all of them was pure 
unconditional love. I've never felt this kind of love here in the physical before because I had spent a lifetime of constantly trying to win people's approval and constantly believing that I had to, um, that I had to do something to be deserving of love, to earn people's love, to win people's love. I always felt that I had to do something to, to earn it. And, but here in the other side, I felt I was loved no matter what. I didn't have to do anything. I was loved just because I existed. And I felt so like at peace and so relaxed. It was like, oh, wow, I can breathe. I can relax. I don't have to work at holding on to people to love me. So that was huge for me. Um, and because I had always worked really, really hard to win people's approval and to hold on to their approval. And I believed that I had to keep doing that. So that was a big thing for me. And so I realized on that side that um, one of the things that I had, one of the things that had caused me to get cancer, <clears throat> excuse me, was the fact that I had never loved myself. I had never known that um, feeling that I need everyone else's approval. What that does is that it sends me the message that I'm not good enough as I am. And so I have to work hard to win people's approval. I need their approval because I don't love myself. So I need other people to love me. And the fact that I need to work hard to win it means that I'm not good enough. So I didn't realize that I had spent a lifetime doing that. And that was one of the biggest reasons that my body kind of was constantly tired and giving up on me. And my body was trying to tell me, no, this is not what you came here for. This is not who you are. And so uh, when I was on that side, I understood why I had got the cancer. I understood that it's so important to love ourselves and to know that we're worthy and deserving of love. And <clears throat> I reached a point on that side where I was given a choice as to whether I want to come back into my physical body or not. And um, I didn't want to come back because it was so beautiful on that side and my body was suffering and I was suffering. But my dad said to me that it's not your time you have gifts waiting for you on the other side. And I felt that, but my body is dying. Why would I want to go to uh, back into a sick body? And my family was suffering, taking care of me. Um, and that's when I realized that, oh, you know, my dad and everybody on the other side, they wanted me to know that now that I knew the truth, the truth of who I really am, the truth of what caused the cancer, that now with knowing this truth, if I went back, my body would heal very quickly. And that's when I made the decision to come back. And my dad said to me, now that you know, you have to go back and live your life fearlessly. That was his big message for me. And so I started to come out of the coma. So I'd been in the coma for about 30 hours. And um, I started to come out of the coma. And of course, my family were so happy and were welcoming me. The doctors were telling my family, even if I come out of the coma, I'm still really sick. It's still critical. I may not survive or uh, the can they didn't believe the cancer would heal. But in four days, my tumor shrunk by 60%. And they were, the doctors were shocked. They didn't know what to write in my medical records. Um, in three weeks, they couldn't find any trace of cancer in my body. They still wanted to keep me in the hospital for observation. I was still a little bit weak. I was still building up strength in my body. But in five weeks, they released me from the hospital to go home and live my life. That was in March of um, 2006. And uh, yes, and, and uh, that's been 15 and a half years now. Oh. It is so amazing. And it's so 
I'm so happy that you made the choice to come back. <laughs> Thank you for that, that you, that you left this amazing place to come back. I appreciate that <laughs> because I can imagine that there was a, a tough choice. <laughs> to, yes, to, to it was a very strange, <laughs> separated 3D reality <laughs> yes, thing. Yes, yes. It was a very yeah. tough choice. <laughs> wow. And um, I mean, thank you so much for sharing your story because I think it's just so valuable for everyone listening to, to just getting to it. I'm, I don't know if you hear my baby is outside. I hope it's not too loud. My two kids are outside playing. Aww. My husband is there as well, but she just woke up. So <laughs> you might Aww. hear her. <laughs> that's so cute. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. No, that's she's, fine. It's a she's beautiful three sound. Three months. She's really, really tiny. So, <laughs> Oh my God. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, you. that's wonderful. Wonderful that Thank you had to have a new life in the house. Yeah, it's beautiful. Aww. It's really beautiful. So um, when you came back and your body healed that quickly, um, was it easy for you to reconnect with, with uh, the truth you gained or was it kind of hard for you to, to reconnect with that feeling of pure love and self-love? Did you have to learn it then again or was it just something yeah. you, you now had and you could just like a treasure, like, yeah, use it? Um, so it was something, so it was a little a bit of both. So it was definitely something I had that was a treasure, but it was very hard to integrate back into this world with that treasure yes. because the people here uh, in this world, it felt like they, because they don't believe it, they... The, you, you meet with people who are uh, skeptical and debunkers and uh, naysayers, and it almost feels like they want to take that gift away from you mm -hmm. if you share it, if you try to share it. So um, when I first came back, I wanted everybody to know, you know, it was like, oh my God, why don't people know this? This can heal disease all over the world. If people only knew how loved they are and how they can just relax and they don't, you know, I was just, I was like thinking that I need to tell everybody who's willing to listen this truth, but it didn't receive the reception that I wanted it to receive. Mm -hmm. And instead And instead of just dealing with people who don't believe you, it's not that people don't believe you and they move on. No, they try to convince you that you are wrong and you are dreaming and that you are delusional. Wow. And so, yeah, true. That's, that's what you get faced with where people mm -hmm. say that, that no, this is, you know, what you're sharing is dangerous. You're giving people false hope and, um, and, and it goes against mainstream and, you know, like all, all kinds of things. So in a, in a way I knew that if I continued to share my story in this way, um, they would start chipping away because this is so persistent, this, this physical reality and people's beliefs <laughs> and people's beliefs in our, that we are three dimensional five sensory beings and nothing more. We are not anything. People's beliefs are so strong and so persistent that I realized if I continued to share, it would start chipping away at my mm -hmm. own belief. I would start doubting. So then I had to start keeping it precious like a secret um, and just turn to it when I needed it. But what I found was that I was pulling myself away from the physical world more and more. And, um, and so that was interesting where I realized that I was pulling away and I started to question, like, why was I back here? Surely I was here to have a physical experience. But if I can't bring the gift with me into the physical, what's the point if people mm -hmm. are going to push back? So I went through a lot of years of also just questioning things. And then the interesting thing that happened was that Wayne Dyer discovered my story because, because at the time, right in the beginning in 2006, when I wanted the whole world to hear it, I started writing about it and I shared it on a website, on a near-death experience website. So it was there on that website. And, um, and then I, I went through, you know, like a few years of just 
processing and questioning the world. But in that time, I made a few friends online, not physical friends, a few online friends who'd had similar experiences, and we would communicate with each other. And so I knew I wasn't going crazy and we would talk about it and write about it. And for me, that was like my, um, you know, I, I knew then that it really happened. I wasn't going crazy. All I needed was just this few five, like five friends and they all had such an experience. And so we all compared notes and we all talked about how our lives were changed and how we were now manifesting a new reality. And I noticed that my life was very different. My health was different. Like I healed very quickly and I knew and I could see how when I perceive my health differently, when I was able to um, know that I am more than a physical being, how it affected me. So, so we kept it our little secret. We would do these experiments, intuition experiments and everything. And then Wayne Dyer discovered my story on the internet. And my first reaction to Wayne Dyer was that, um, was that what about all the, all the skeptics and the debunkers? And he said, don't worry about them. I'll help you through that. And he said that there are people who are hungry to hear what you have to say because it's not mainstream, because these people are hungry. They don't know where to go because the world is filled with debunkers and naysayers. So he said, but there are people who are hungry. And he said, and that's my audience. That means Wayne's audience. He said, they would love you. You need to focus on them and don't focus on the skeptics. And so when he had me write the book and brought me on stage, I realized, wow, he's right. There are a lot of people who are hungry for this information too. That's amazing. Thank God. <laughs> that you yeah. did that. Yeah. Um, I, I have so many questions. So the, the first question um, I have is, I, I know, I also know a few people who had a similar experience that who were really sick and had a near death experience. And the interesting thing is, they all say the same. So I always think See? that all the skeptics just talk to like 20 people who had that experience and you They, who don't know each other and you will see they will all say exactly the same what happened what, what I find so interesting like it's 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 amazing so were the people you met then on the internet the, the online friends you had who had a similar experience was it similar like also what they yeah what yes they yeah yes it was and it was and and the thing is when you speak with people who have a similar experience you don't need to spend a lot of time convincing them and your conversation just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, that's one of the things I realized is that when I spent time, so what, what would happen in the beginning was that um, one of the doctors who researched my case, he was amazing. He completely believed me. He saw my medical records. He said, whichever way you look at it, you should be dead. But what he <laughs> wanted to do was he wanted me to speak in the medical circles because he wanted other people in the medical circles and in the scientific circles to hear what I had to say. So his cause was very, very noble. I loved what he was doing, that he was trying to do that. What I didn't realize, uh, I mean, I came to understand it later, was that speaking in those medical circles was very draining for me because because they want proof. And maybe they walk away later thinking, oh yeah, what she's saying is, is, is true. She has a point. And I'm sure the things I said changed the way they felt. I'm sure it changed the way they view physical people when they're, when they're uh, medically treating them. I'm sure it helped them. But for me, it didn't make for interesting conversation because every conversation, every question is about trying to convince a skeptic. But when I would speak with other people who were 
near-death experiencers or people who were already had spiritual experiences, who be already believed, who already knew, our conversations would go into, okay, what shall we challenge ourselves to do next? What shall we intuit? Let's go deeper into our intuition. <laughs> let's, let's do remote viewing, like which means to, to um, intuit something that we can't see, or let's see how we can heal this. Let's, ex let's do a healing experiment. So it was like, two completely different types of things, if you know what I mean, two, two worlds. It was two completely different worlds. One world stimulated me. The other one talking to the scientists and the medics, even though I knew I was impacting their view, it was still very draining dealing with their questions and their needing proof and everything. Yeah, I can imagine. So what I find so interesting is that the most important message you got is to love yourself and how yes. important it is to love yourself and I found it really beautiful the way you said it because it makes so much sense that, that we get ill if we don't love ourselves <laughs> yeah I mean it makes yes. if, if you think about it, it makes so much sense so um I would say, fortunately, maybe unfortunately, I don't know. Not all of us can make the experience you had of, of a near-death experience. I don't know if that's good or not. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but how can we, because what I know is that there are so many people who have a hard time accepting themselves and tapping yes. into this knowing of how valuable they are and how large their soul is and of who they really are. So what would you say, how can ordinary people uh, who don't have an experience like that tap into this knowing or how can we maybe in everyday life connect better to, to this kind of self-love? How can we nurture that? So there are many, many things we can do. So first of all, you know, one of the reasons I share everything that I do and I, that I keep speaking to people is because I don't want people to have to have a near death experience to learn what I learned. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So no, nobody needs to have a near death experience. So first of all is awareness. It's the awareness that it is important to love yourself. That's the first thing. Um, my slogan is love yourself like your life depends on it because it does. And And so a lot of people still believe that it's selfish to love themselves. So the first step is awareness. And I want to share why that's really important. I grew up believing that it's selfish to love myself and that it's better to give than to receive, that it's better to be of service to others and, and all of that. All of that is great. It is true. But a lot of people, the people who easily be, do those things. The people who easily love um, or are of service to other people are the very same people who believe it's selfish to love themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what I want to say to people is that um, you need to be aware that, um, that in order to love other people, you need to have love within yourself. You really need to have love within yourself. When you are of service to other people and you don't love yourself, you're basically, um, when you don't love yourself, you're basically doing two things. One is you're taking the attention off yourself because you don't love yourself. And so it's like, Because you constantly want to take your mind off yourself, you find it easier to put your focus on other people. So a lot of people have a tendency to do that because you want to avoid your own problems. You decide to focus on other people's problems. So ask yourself, do I have a tendency to do that? Um, the second thing is a lot of people who are helping other people, they may be doing it from a place of obligation. Ask yourself, am I doing it because I want to win that person's approval? Am I doing it because I don't want them to be disappointed in me? Not because I want to do it, not because I love them and this is what I want to do, but because um, I'm afraid of disapproval or I'm trying to win approval 
or I'm trying to prove to them that I'm likable. So be honest with yourself and ask yourself, why are you doing these acts of service and this kindness? So it's this awareness that's so important, which I get into really deeply in, in my book, um, Sensitive is the New Strong. But what I want to share, though, that's super important, is that when I... Uh, before I even got sick, I was that person who would do things for other people. Mm -hmm. And I always felt other people are more important than me. Other people's um, problems are more important than my problems. And so I was always doing things for other people. And even if I had problems, I would ignore my problems and do things for other people. Mm -hmm. Then even when I got sick, I still felt that I didn't want to give other people trouble. And so I didn't even tell people I was sick. Only my husband and my immediate family knew. And I would say, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. I don't want to trouble them. I don't want them to treat me differently. And so I would still do things for other people, show up for other people, be of service to other people, even when I was sick. Even as I got sicker and sicker, um, people knew I was sick, but I didn't want to trouble them. And so when people would do things for me, when they would want to help me because I was sick, I would feel obligated and burdened by their help. And instead of just accepting and receiving their help, I would feel burdened. And I would, uh, and I would say, no, no, I don't need anything. And immediately I would feel oh, I need to repay them for doing that, even though I was sick. So it wasn't even getting sick and getting cancer that taught me the lesson that I need to love myself and I need to take care of myself. No, it was death. It was only when I died did I realize that, oh my gosh, I am, um, that I, I, I matter, my life matters. I needed to take care of myself and put myself first and worry about my own problems and not everybody else's. And so this is why it's important for me to share this with people. Don't wait until you get sick and especially don't wait until you die. Um, so, so some of the tips that I tell people, and every day I meet people who say that, oh my God, I relate to that. I'm like that. And so I say to them, here are the things you need to do. Number one, you need to learn to receive. If you are, if you relate to what I'm saying, what it means is that you give and give and give of yourself, but you don't know how to receive. So number one, please be aware that it's okay to receive. If somebody gives you a gift, do not feel that you, if you have an obligation to pay it back, that's why it's a gift. If you immediately feel that you have to pay it back, then it's not a gift. Then you're not accepting their gift. Then it's a transaction. It's a purchase. It's a barter. But when the person gave it to you, they gave it to you as a gift, whether it's the gift of time or money or whatever it is, accept it. Just watch that inability to receive. That's a big thing for people who get sick. Um, the other thing is, the second thing I tell people is that do something for yourself every day. People who have an inability to receive, they also have trouble performing a service for themselves. They can perform service for everybody, but they can't perform a service for themselves. So do something for yourself every day, whether it's to... Um, to soak in a tub, you know, when, uh, whether it's to take time out to go to a movie alone or to go for a walk or to go to the park or whatever it is, whatever it is that you're always saying, oh, I don't have time to do that. I have to take care of my kids. I have to cook. I have to take care of my aging parents and blah, blah, blah. We always have an excuse and everybody else is more important than us. We need to do at least one thing for ourselves every single day to show ourselves that our lives matter. Those are the two biggest things that I can tell you. The third thing is to remember that you are a spiritual being. What does it mean that you are a spiritual being? It means that if you're a spiritual being, 
It means that you have come from spirit into this body for a reason. If you have come from spirit, it means that you are a facet of God. What is spirit but a facet of God? All of us are connected. We are all a facet of God. So if you do not love yourself, if you do not allow yourself to be who you are, if you do not allow yourself, if you do not take care of yourself, then what are you doing? You are denying a facet of God from expressing itself through you in this time and space. So those are the three things I would want you to know. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. What is your most important spiritual routine you have to reconnect to yourself and to your spirit? Um, so I have different things that I do. Uh, one is I love to um, go outside. I love being out in the sun. I love the ocean and the sun. And when I can see the ocean and the sun, I feel really good. I feel connected. I feel expanded. Um, it just has to be big. There are some people who love the mountains and uh, some people who love meditating in a darkened room. My husband, for example, Danny, he loves meditating in a darkened room. For me, I need to be out in nature, in the sun, and that makes me feel connected. So you have to honor what it is for you that makes you feel connected. One of the things that I realized is that living in a city drains me. So we chose from that point on never to live in the midst of a city. We like to be not far from a city, like near a city, because we do like access to things like internet and, and all our uh, creature comforts like that. But we don't like to live in the thick of a city. We have to be somewhere that's close to nature. So, so we live by the ocean where I am over here and we get lots of sun and ocean. And so I feel really great. And, uh, and so um, you just have to figure out what it is for you that makes you feel connected to your higher self and to your soul. So when, um, and for me, another thing that helps me a lot is music, certain music, certain spiritual music. Mm -hmm. So when I have nature and when I have music, I can really connect in a big way. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is when you, um, when you talked about intuition and to be intuitive, um, I think this is something, especially here in the Western world, a lot of people are so disconnected from their intuition and from being intuitive and really being in this connection to your higher self and to allow yourself to be guided and to listen to that voice and all the information that is coming through. Um, how, how do you connect to your intuition? How, the question I always get as well is, how do I know if it's my intuition or my ego? How do I know if it's my heart or my head? So how can we, do, do you have a way how to connect better to that? How do you know <laughs> yes. sort of, that it is your intuition? <clears throat> So there are a few tips I can give you here. Um, so number one is that your intuition comes through when you are at peace and when you least expect it. So like when you're not, when your mind is completely relaxed. So it comes through, for example, just before you fall asleep or even in your dreams, because you're totally relaxed. It can come through your dreams. It can come through just before you fall asleep. It can come through your intuition gives you messages when you're just waking up, but not fully awake. Um, when you're in the shower, uh, that's a really good place where people's intuition comes through because your mind is just wandering freely. Here's when your intuition does not come through and has a lot of trouble coming through. It's when you are in a constant state of fear. When you're in a constant state of panic, your intuition cannot penetrate through that density. Um, so what happens is that um, when you are feeling relaxed and you're operating from a space of your, your heart and your higher self, the idea is always when you're relaxed, when your eyes are closed, you, your heart is open and your higher consciousness, your connection with the upper world is open. 
But if, for example, you are listening to the news all day, every day, what it does is that it puts you in this state of fear and panic. And when you're in this state of fear and panic, interestingly, you start to operate from a place of survival of, um, you know, and, and so when you're in this place of um, fight or flight survival, we're not really in danger at the moment, but your spirit, your energy is coming from that endangered space and it cuts off. So when you're in that endangered space, you, you, um, what you do is you awaken your lower energies. When you have the chakra system, it's your lower chakras that are the chakras of physical survival. So you are so entrenched in physical survival when you are listening to the news all day, every day. You become so entrenched in physical survival. That's how you become disconnected with your intuition, with your, um, with your spirit. So I always tell people, minimize, minimize your listening to the news, minimize listening and watching things that put you into that fear-based mode. Of course, you will have people who will say to you, but I need to know what's going on in the outside world and blah, blah, blah. And yes, you can know what's going on in the outside world by listening just to what you need to listen to or listen once a week or whatever. But um, the very people who are addicted to the news are the ones who are disconnected with their higher self. And that's, you know, and so it's your choice. It's your choice. Do you want to be ingrained and embedded in the physical fight or flight, survival, living in stress, disconnected with the other side, but still get your news fix every day? Or do you want to actually connect with your higher self? and your intuition, you then you do have to start letting go of listening to all the fear-based messages that get thrown at you. Because here's what happens. When you start listening to your higher self, your higher self, and when your intuition opens up, you get different kinds of news, you get different kinds of messages. And those messages help you survive in a very different way. Mm -hmm. They give you messages about... Um, uh, about why you're here, what is your purpose, how to follow your purpose. Um, this is what you're here to do. And then, and so now here is the way to know between your ego or your mind versus your actual intuition. The fear-based messages are your mind, but any message, any message that uplifts you, that makes you feel good, is your intuition. And I really mean that. And people are like, oh no, that's my imagination. And I say, your intuition uses your imagination to communicate with you when you allow it. But your ego will say, oh, that's your imagination. Your ego will say, oh, who do you think you are? The, you know, do you think you can really do that? Or, oh, you shouldn't quit your job. You're, so those fear-based messages are your mind, not even necessarily your ego, but those fear-based messages are your mind. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear an uplifting message, like, yeah, you should do this. Yeah, you should take that risk. Yes, this is what you should do. That's actually your intuition saying, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. This is who you are. I have one question to regarding that point because I know this voice so well and usually it's things that as you said that are also a bit like you you freak out inside of you a little bit when they when this voice comes and say oh you should write that book or you should go on yes. stage or do that and you go like no <laughs> so, um, how can we grow into the how can we build trust into this voice knowing that It wouldn't say anything that harms us, but that is always for us. So you know what I mean? How, how can yes. we trust that voice better? Especially if someone listening right now and it's like, I hear this voice, but I'm so afraid. I know this is the decision I should make, make but I, I'm so afraid to go there. What, what helps to, to, to listen? I would say to the person to take baby steps, And so first, um, one thing that can help 
is, is journaling. So writing. So when you hear the voice, write down what the voice says, even if you don't follow it, even if you're too scared mm -hmm. to follow it. So write it down and see if you see a pattern in what the voice is telling you. And then take baby steps with the small things that you can do that the voice is telling you to do. So when you notice things happening, when you notice synchronicities, when you notice signs, when you notice all these things, write it down in your journal. And then slowly you will start to build the trust when you see that, oh my gosh, this uh, the my my higher self or the spirits on the other side they're really trying to help me they really are these are the signs they're sending me um i have also done a youtube video recently on signs from the other side and so i would say look for the signs and write them down when you see them as you take these baby steps you'll start to trust your intuition and your higher self more and more and also Sometimes I have people tell me that I used to trust my intuition so much, but lately I've, I've lost it. I've lost trust in it and, and I don't know how to regain it back. So what I want to say <clears throat> is that lately a lot of people are struggling because there has been a lot that's been going on in our world and a lot that's been happening in our news that have kept people hooked into what's going on in this physical world. Mm -hmm. So much so that everything in the news has put everybody on like a panic high alert status. And when we're all living from this fight or flight space, all of us together, we kind of start to lose touch mm -hmm. with that higher self. So what I am inviting each person to do is that start by realizing that's what's going on. Start by realizing the reason you've lost touch is because you've been focusing on physical survival. Because when you're so highly focused on physical survival, what you're doing is you're sending yourself the message that I don't trust in my in, in the universe, that the universe mm -hmm. is protecting me. I don't trust in the in that my spirit has a plan i don't trust any of that so i my physical body has to stay tuned to everything on the news to make sure that i take care of myself and my people so this is how you've been you're being trained to live by our our i would say our um our energetic field right now you know the the cultural field that we live in this community cultural field is training us to live one way, but I'm inviting you to live another way. The other way is much more powerful if you dare to step out of it. Wow. Thank you for sharing. So important. I have one uh, last question. So imagine it is the last day of your life and you live many, 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 many more years. You get really old, have an amazing life, change so many other lives through the story and um, I would come to you on your last day of your life and I would say, Anita, I'm so sorry. Uh, there has been a technical problem and everything is deleted. All your videos, everything, <laughs> your book, your books are gone. Um, <laughs> but I have a white sheet of paper and a pen and you could write on this white sheet of paper three wisdoms from you that you would like, if everything else is gone, that you would like humanity to know. What would you write down? I would write, the first one would be love yourself like your life depends on it. That would be number one. Number two is always be yourself. In other words, don't do things to just please other people. Be yourself, live your dreams. Number three would be have fun, laugh and have lots of fun. Don't take life seriously. Wow. I love this. Anita, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. It's such a pleasure to listen to you. And it's so, I'm so grateful that you had this experience and that you can share with, with us what you experience and how, how life changing it is, because I think it, it really is. And so important to, to, yeah, to really integrate this knowledge and this wisdom to know that 
at the end, it's all about love. <laughs> always has been yes. and always will be. <laughs> and yeah. yes. Yeah, and it just needs angels like you that come back and that try to remember us <laughs> and to remind <laughs> us who, who, who we are. So thank you. Thank you so much for this. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Laura. You asked great questions. This was so much fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.